All right, we're going to move along. Uh, the second concept is titled Grants for New Investigators to Promote Diversity in Genomic Research. This concept was developed by staff members Mike Pazin and Jyoti Dayal, and Jyoti will give the presentation. All right, thank you so much. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Council, for this opportunity to present to you a count, uh, concept clearance, Grants for New Investigators to Promote Diversity in Genomics Research. I'd like to acknowledge and thank my colleague, Mike Pazin, who will join us in the Q&A session, R01 Working Group, to, for their support and guidance in developing this initiative. Oops. There we go, okay. Um, so in continuing with the theme of workforce diversity, our goal for this concept is to increase the number of investigators in genomics research from diverse backgrounds, including underrepresented demographic groups. So today I'll be covering background, uh, scope and objectives of the concept, uh, how this compares to other funding opportunity um, activities and ask council for their input in the discussion. There are many benefits to fostering a diverse workforce. It promotes diversity of scientific ideas, we gain an understanding of different perspectives from researchers, and it also maintains cultures of inclusive excellence. And collectively, this will help synergize efforts to increase the diversity of individuals included in genomics research. The NHGRI uh, strategic vision was published in October of 2020 and lists the genomics workforce as a guiding principle for human genomics that the promise of genomics cannot fully be achieved without a diverse. The diversity R01 is one part of the overall NHGRI vision. And as Vince uh, discussed earlier, NHGRI recently published its action agenda for building a diverse genomics workforce. This initiative is part of that emerging portfolio to support research programs to build up independent genomic research careers. NIH issued a diversity statement to identify four categories of groups underrepresented in the US biomedical research enterprise. The four groups will um, define individuals who are underrepresented, individuals from certain racial and ethnic backgrounds, individuals with disabilities, individuals from certain disadvantaged backgrounds, and women under circumstance, uh, certain circumstances. And for further details or expanded definitions for each group, please refer to the notice link. While we don't have data on all underrepresented groups, we'd like to report on data from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. And this data is coming from the NIH Scientific Workforce Diversity Office. So for example, in the area of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields, they reported that 14% of PhDs in 2018 were awarded to URM candidates up from 7% from 2000 to 2008. And for R01 applicants, there's a slight increase in Black, African American, and Hispanic Latino uh, R01 applicants from 2013 to 2018. And while the progress is minimal, there's still more work to be done to make a difference. I'd like to call attention to two recent publications that came out commenting on the status of grant funding to diverse and underrepresented groups. Uh, these publications call for the urgent attention to invite and improve representation from underrepresented groups. And all of this is to say that we are moving the needle in the right direction, but there's still more work to be done. So just to reiterate, uh, the Diversity R1 RFA uh, addresses the NHGRI action agenda to develop and support uh, research transition programs to independent genomic researchers, uh, research careers. This initiative would focus on new investigator and early stage investigators. We would implement uh, this similar to other diversity announcements and consistent with the NIH diversity statement and any research topics are suitable within NHGRI's mission uh, and open across um, the uh, scientific topics in Division of Genomic Medicine, Division of Genome Sciences, and the Division of uh, Genomics and Society. And then the topic of research in uh, interest is up to the investigator. Uh, this allows for maximum 
flexibility, and we want to promote all types of genomics research among diverse investigators. NHGRI is considering five to seven new awards per year for three years uh, and considering a set aside of $5.25 million in total cost in the first fiscal year. The $5.25 million is tied to making seven new awards per year. Uh, applications would be limited to 500K direct cost per year and the project period would be limited to five years. So relative to other ongoing activities, the NIDDK uh, R21 PAR, which we are currently signed on to, is open to new investigators and early stage investigators and provides up to three years of funding at 125K direct costs uh, uh, limit per year. And this is aimed at increasing uh, workforce diversity and really laid the groundwork for the R1 diversity RFA. And the middle box is the standard NIH R01, uh, which is open to all career stages, um, has uh, up to five years of uh, funding and 500K direct costs uh, per year limit. The diversity RFA is unique in that NHGRI is making this a uh, priority. Uh, we're focusing on uh, new investigators and early stage investigators. And since this is an RFA, we are setting aside funds and having a dedicated special emphasis panel uh, to provide advice to reviewers at an NHGRI-led uh, review. So this will help increase workforce diversity and similar to the standard uh, NIH R1 is recognized as a career milestone. So we're asking council to weigh in on the following um, alternative career stages. So we're starting out with new investigators and early, uh, early stage investigators. Uh, alternatives which could um, expand to a wider group could include investigators who are new to NHGRI. They may have expertise in other areas and would like to do genomics research. Uh, investigators without an active R01 equivalent award could apply. And then for established investigators, do we set a cap on the direct cost limit? And would it divert funds uh, from individuals at early career stages? For the yearly di uh, direct cost limit, um, at 500K direct costs um, per year limit, this would support more expensive uh, grants, but alternatively, less direct costs per year could support more awards. Um, is the five to seven awards per year appropriate? More awards for more awards would require resources or smaller awards. Uh, fewer awards might be too few to make a difference, recognizing the challenge to predict the response for this RFA. So this concludes my presentation. And uh, in the interest of being able to see raised hands uh, in the chat, I'll keep the slide up for another 30 seconds and then take it down. And then we're asking council members, uh, Drs. Chung, Rich, and Parker to start us off with the council discussion, but we will uh, welcome comments from all council members. So I will stop there. And Dr. Chung, please uh, feel free to comment. Sure. So I'm strongly supportive of this. I think this continues in terms of, as we've been talking about, you know, multiple opportunities. And I think people will need multiple opportunities to continue their, their progress in terms of their career. Um, I guess I was a little confused about some of the mechanics. I hadn't thought, um, Yodi, when you were presenting this, that this would be established investigators. And so I just wanted to get clarified if I understood that right. I, I thought this was really early investigators. And then the other mechanical question I was trying to think about is that there's, because you're going to get people with a diversity of research topics that they're coming in to study, I'm assuming you're getting, I, I'm confused about the special emphasis panel. I'm assuming these are going to multiple other study sections with people who are expert in those areas, but then the special emphasis panel is taking those reviews and making decisions, or how does this sort of process work and how do you compare apples and oranges, I guess, if they're reviewed in different study sections? Sure, so I can answer your first question um, with the established investigators. So the question to council is, uh, should we include established investigators in this pool? We, the way the concept is written right now is we started out with new investigators and early stage investigators but should we be considering um, extending this out to a larger pool of, of applicants? 
Okay, I get my my own personal opinion is, you know, not if they've already hit that milestone in terms of having their own R ones and things like that. I mean, um, I, to me, that's not what this opportunity should be about. Okay, and your next question uh, for remind me uh, is about uh, the review. Is that correct? Right. So, who reviews these, and then how does the special emphasis panel work in terms of? I guess, comparing reviews across study sections, or is it everyone's reviewed by one special emphasis panel, even if they're very different specialty areas? Uh, so we haven't discussed that in detail, but I, I know that this, this would be done at uh, NHGRI. Um, uh, Rudy or I see Carolyn uh, coming up, if you could help provide some clarification on that. All right, well, this is, yeah, Rudy, go ahead. No, I. We'll defer okay. to the division directors. I will comment when we get to the review question. Yeah, so this is Terry. Um, so I'm, I'm helping uh, Jyoti with this one. And, and really the plan is to have an NHGRI special emphasis panel. So it would be a single special emphasis panel. Um, we have a fabulous review group and I don't know how they do it, but they manage to pull in expertise um, in all of the areas relevant to applications um, that are received. So, so we're pretty confident that it'll be an expert review and probably have more expertise, uh, definitely have more expertise in genomics than one would see in a general um, study section, but as well cover all of those areas. And I was just going to echo that we have experience with this. Our genomic innovator is a situation where those go to a single panel and cover the whole, the similar breadth. And we've really had successful, again, with our strong review panel. So just giving you a, a, an example that we already do this in some situations with success. Okay, thanks. Okay, so Raphael, I see your hand up, but I'm going to allow the other uh, assigned discussants to go first, and then we'll come back to you, okay? All right, Lisa, are you next? Can be. I think this follows on the discussion about review, because I had been interested in the concept uh, document in the note that um, applications uh, from um, underrepresented uh, group applicants um, had been less successful, uh, but that this had to do with choice of research topic, more focused on community and population research, uh, less concerned with more fundamental and mechanistic investigations. And I was wondering whether, uh, whether that's, oh, that focus is okay whether there is a desire to uh, attract applicants into one prong or the other of that uh, po possible dichotomy. Um, and then depending on the answer to what's, what's desired, what will be done to try to shape the focus of the research it, uh, question, if anything at all? Or is this just going to be handled by review, being more open to the broad range of uh, research foci? Yeah, so we want to maximize, again, flexibility. We don't want to put any restrictions or filters on uh, the topic of interest. If there's interest in community, um, community work, you know, we would welcome that. Um, and I think there was a part two to your question. Yes. Can it all be just, I'm sorry, can it all just be managed by educating the review panel? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah. I think, Jyoti, if I could step in here, I think if we have champions on the review panel, review panel members that will champion that kind of research, the problem takes care of itself. Anything else from you, Lisa? If not, we'll move on to Steve Rich then, please. Yeah, uh, GOT, uh, congratulations with you and your team and Mike for putting something together like this. Um, I'm very supportive. I did have a couple of comments and many of those have already been spoken from the previous uh, concept. And, and part of it is, you know, defining metrics for success um, using data. I, I think the metrics for success of this program may be different than the metrics for success for the previous program. Uh, and you know, understanding what it is that you're really targeting as as what are those appropriate metrics. Um, you know, if if a metric is they get an R01 and they go to another institution because they've got an R01, that might 
not necessarily be the best metric, but uh, you know, any sort of ideas of what it is that can be considered as a, as a success for the program. I do think there's an issue of mentoring. Um, you almost need to figure out, you know, mentoring at understanding how to put the application together, mentoring if you get the application, mentoring as you continue with your professional development. Essentially, it's, it's again, what was stated as lifelong mentoring. It, it's something that can really be, I think, critical to success uh, as, as you define it. I am also in favor of the new investigator, early stage investigator. If someone already has an R01 or has had an R01, it's already met the criteria. I've also had some experience in working in foundations and other uh, types of areas where the, they've been giving uh, support to established investigators new to the field, and it hardly ever seems to work out well. Um, it's almost like they needed money to fund some work that they were doing. And here's another disease or an area that they wanted to go, that they could get money from by going into it. And it's not that it's that way every time, but I'd much rather focus on the next generation of investigators and the new investigator, early stage investigator. I do think there's an issue related to the social networking component of this that really needs to be thought through. Um, it's a, it's a social support. It's a support of the peers. It's support of individuals who may be, uh, you know, potential mentors. And I'm not certain how you can do it. Um, within the American Diabetes Association, there was a Pathways to Independence uh, or a Pathways uh, program where uh, individuals who were at the postdoc to faculty member and early faculty positions get tied in with a mentor. Uh, they're highlighted at the scientific sessions. There's groups of, of meetings. They develop a network. Uh, I don't know how this can be done in this program, but I think it's something that we're thinking about in helping them develop this social network and support system. And then the, the last thing is, you know, is in a sense, five to seven awards per year appropriate. Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, you probably could double, triple, order of magnitude, increase it. But given it's a new program, uh, it's hard to know exactly what is the right number because you don't know how many applications you'll get even the first or second or third offering. But as long as NHGRI has a, a, an ability to be flexible, and, you know, I'm not certain how any governmental agency can be flexible, but hopefully NHGRI is. If they get a lot of applications and there are 15, I should say, at the first series that look really fabulous, but you only have funds for five to seven, is there another pot of money someplace that you can use? Or even partner with another institute. You know, some are focused more on uh, like Alzheimer's or heart disease or something like that. Can you go, go, go with your handout to uh, NHLBI or NIA and say, here's a great way of increasing diversity and you can take partial credit for it if you give some money to this. Just somehow make certain that you have really great people that don't fall through the cracks. So I'll stop there. So Terry, I saw your camera come on. Did you want to speak to something here? Um, I could, but um, I, I thought perhaps I'd let Jyoti um, uh, respond first. There were, there were a lot of questions there, Jyoti. Do you want to take one or two of them? Sure, I, I can take on the the mentorship. Um, so there are other there are programs that are are focused on mentorship, and what we're trying to do here is to. Um, get beyond that, the early career stage and address those shortfalls and, and helping get the uh, investigators that are uh, one that career milestone stage. So that's, that's our, our goal for here. And uh, let me see if there's some other. Um, so thank you for your comment about the new investigators um, and early stage investigators. And then um, Terry, I don't know if you wanted to maybe comment on the, the, the additional funds. 
Um, sure. So, so with any of these programs, we we do, and we appreciate the the suggestion. We do reach out to other institutes and ask if they would like to partner with us. Uh, this is how we got involved in the NIDDK program. Um, that's very similar to this one. We actually built it, uh, built ours upon that one. So they reached out to us, we participated, and it's been a successful program. So we'll do the same thing here um, and hope for for participation. Um, I, I think um, we, we would see this as a priority. We start off with, with five to seven as a starting point, but, um, but you know, if we have funds this year or later or can shift them around, you know, we'd certainly take council's advice that uh, probably um, we could use a lot more in, in this area. Uh, Jyoti makes a good point that we do have a lot of programs that are, that are focused on the career development stage, which are a little bit earlier in the, in the process, and those have formal mentoring. Uh, but I think we could consider um, uh, including some language in the solicitation that might address that, or at least allow for it, uh, where it's not something that is typically uh, done in an R01 independent investigator uh, award, and, and sometimes is not viewed as, as favorably as, as someone who is not uh, seeking that. I think you had also uh, asked about metrics of success, Steve. Um, when that's something I think we need to, to develop. Um, it, we certainly would look at the end of the day at, at whether we'd increase the number of R01s that we were funding to, to minority investigators, which currently we're quite below the NIH average. So, so that's probably our, our number one metric of success. But if you have other suggestions, we'd, we'd very much welcome them. Well, you know, if, if the uh, individual is at a site that has historically not been successful uh, in R01 funding of any sort, or certainly genomic R R01 funding, I would think the training of additional students or fellows or having sort of the right, you know, sort, of, sort of the, you know, the effect of here's someone who has really been successful in genomics and now graduate students and others will flock to that person and you'll actually see a spreading of the wealth in a way. Um, I think something like that might be useful if that can be quantified in some way. Great, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try and do that, thank you. Or like a rainmaker. Sure. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind that there, there are a, a lot of investigators at the you know, minority investigators who are not at minority um, institutions or under uh, under resourced institutions, and they still have um, terrible rates of uh, getting, you know, um, awards and, and re awards. So so it's right. not just that they're all concentrated in places that don't have resources. Right. All right, Raphael, you win the Day One Patience Award. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question relates to the possibility that there's some confounding that we want to learn about between uh, these categories that you're looking at and the type of grants that are being uh, applied for or the types of, of, of uh, the areas of research that are being applied for. I, I, I'm not sure if that has been looked at. I, when I hear and read these papers, hear about and read these papers about the percentages being lower, they give a general percentage. Has anybody looked at what it looks like when you break it up by area or by institute within the NIH or within any other subcategory of type of grant? Is it across the board lower percentages or, or does it change? depending on which one. So Jyoti, maybe I'll, I'll take this one as well. R Rafa, there is a growing literature on this and, and it's, it, it appears to be really across the board. Um, the, the issue of, of research topic is only one of many issues that relates to the lower success rate here. Um, there is a tendency and it seems to be you know, pretty, pretty strong and significant um, for minority and underserved investigators to be focusing less on basic research and more on applied research. And we know that uh, in any realm uh, that those tend to do less well. 
Uh, NIH is, is doing a fair amount of investigation into this and probably has the sample sizes to be able to, to look at it. NHGRI doesn't. Um, and even at the NIH level, the, the papers that Jyoti quoted, you know, they, they aggregate five years of, of data in order to be able to get enough numbers. So, um, so I agree, this is an, an area of, of very active investigation um, within NIH. We're, we're probably the only people that can really do it because we have access to the confidential information that other people don't in terms of when people succeed and when they fail and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I agree, it's something we'd really like to learn more about. All right, thank you. Okay, Sharon, you're next. Well, my comment, Terry sort of just addressed, but it was sort of back to a comment you made, Rudy. I, I think the issue of training reviewers is not simple. Uh, and the issue of eliminating bias is not simple. And, and I do, I think this mechanism is very important, but I think the Institute really has to look at how do we train reviewers um, what is this review panel going to look like? Is there going to be additional training? Because I, I don't think it's only, I mean, Terry just raised the issue that it's many things. It's not just subject area. But I, I do think it's sort of on us to create the opportunities, but also to make sure that the review is as unbiased as possible. Well said. Other questions for Jyoti or Mike? All right, you get 10 seconds to find the mute button and I don't see anybody acting. So can I get a motion to approve the concept? Second. So move. <clears throat> All in favor for five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Anyone abstaining or opposed? All right, thank you very much.